Today we are delighted to have a lecture by Professor Saul Tukolsky uh, on testing uh, no hair theorem and area theorems by LIGO. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. So uh, let me start, uh, first of all, two things. So first of all, if you have any questions, um, please feel free just to uh, interrupt me. You can, if you're online, unmute yourself and ask the question, or you can type it in the chat. I can't actually read the chat very easily. So if, if you see a, me a, a message in the chat, please, you know, whoever sees it, unmute yourself and, and ask the question. Um, the second thing is, uh, I want to acknowledge my collaborators on this project, uh, in particular, Matt Giesler, who was a graduate student of mine at Caltech, and he made the key discovery that I'm going to talk about uh, today. And uh, secondly, Max Isi, who uh, was a postdoc um, and led the data analysis part of this project. And there are some archive numbers if you want to look up uh, papers on this work. All right, so let me start with this uh, famous sketch done by Kip Thorne in the 1980s. This was long before LIGO was built, uh, long before we could actually calculate the signals that LIGO might see from two black holes that are orbiting each other, uh, emitting gravitational waves, spiraling in and merging. And you can see the uh, process is divided up into three regimes. So the first one is the in-spiral. This is when the two black holes are relatively widely separated. Um, you can see they're drawn with these like vortex lines around them to represent the fact that the black holes can be spinning and dragging space time around with them. And the red is the gravitational waves that's being emitted. So the system loses energy and spirals in uh, tighter in a tighter and tighter binary. And underneath is the is H, that's the letter we use to represent the amplitude of the gravitational wave. And that's what LIGO measures, the, the, the strain in the detector. And you see that part of the waveform is labeled known. And the reason is when the two black holes are relatively far apart, gravity is weak. The speeds of the black holes in their orbit is small compared with the speed of light. So we can use perturbation theory. We start with a Newtonian circular orbit, and then we make small perturbations of that to describe the general relativistic effects. And so that can be worked out to uh, various orders in perturbation theory. And so that part of the signal is known. At the very end, after the two black holes have merged, this part is called the ring down because it's like a bell, right? You strike a bell and it oscillates and you hear the, the tone of the bell, but the sound waves carry away the energy of the oscillation, and so the bell rings down. It settles down to a, an equilibrium quiescent state. So in the same way, the black holes will settle down to a single isolated rotating black hole. And we know now from general relativity that that has to be a Kerr black hole. It's described by the Kerr metric. And that's also labeled known. Because again, we can use perturbation theory, but this time you perturb the Kerr metric. In other words, you take the equilibrium black hole and make small perturbations of it, and then you can calculate the rig down. And in fact, that was the subject of my PhD thesis a long time ago. Um, and I never dreamed that anything that I would do in general relativity would any at any point have any applicability in the real world. That shows you, you never know. And then in the middle, the merger, that's drawn as this big mess where the two black holes come together. 
And you can see the form of the waveform there is some squiggle. And there, there's no small parameters. We can't do perturbation theory. And so that's labeled supercomputer, right? The idea is that you're going to solve Einstein's equations numerically to do that. OK. So now we fast forward to 2015 to the first LIGO detection. So GW15, that tells you the year 09, September 14. And the, I'm going to walk you through this, but the conclusion is that if you're thinking about alternative theories of gravity, general relativity is actually pretty good, at least for, I mean, black holes are sort of the strongest sources that we could imagine arising in the universe today, right? They're the regions of the highest curvature, and if where there were going to be deviations from general relativity, here's where we might expect to see them first. So this figure on the right here is taken from the LIGO detection paper. And one of the detectors is at Hanford in the state of Washington. And you can see this red uh, squiggle waveform. And you know it sort of looks a little bit like Kip's drawing. Um, and then on the right is the second detector at Livingston, Louisiana. And what the observers have done here is they've taken the red waveform, shifted it in time by the difference in light travel time from the source to Livingston and the source to Hanford, and superposed them. And you don't have to do any fancy data analysis. Just by eye, you can see it's the same signal right, within the noise. Um, so that's how we know this is a gravitational wave. right? It's the strain in the detector. It's not terrestrial. It would be a heck of a coincidence if two people independently slammed car doors in the parking lots of these observatories and produced exactly the same signal, right? So it's an astrophysical signal. It's gravitational waves. In the middle panel, um, if you look carefully, you'll see a gray um, sort of waveform. That's the signal from the top panel which has been broadened now to include the noise, the effect, it's the uncertainty in the detected wave. And now the red is basically a numerical relativity waveform. So uh, our group, our, our collaboration had learned how to solve Einstein's equations on big computers. And this was sort of a model that fit the data very well. And again, you don't have to do fancy data analysis. You can just by eye see it's a very good reproduction of the signal. And so that's how we know that what the observatory saw was two black holes spiraling together. The last panel in the bottom row is the residual. So you take the best fit numerical relativity waveform and you subtract it from the signal above. And this squiggle, if you analyze it statistically, is consistent with, with noise, right? So there's no, there's no discrepancy at the level of the precision of the measurement. And that turns out to be about 4%. So if there are deviations from general relativity in an event like this, it can't be arbitrarily big. It's small. It's less than 4%. So we already know that from the very first detection. And these limits are only going to get tighter, right? In other words, as the detector sensitivity improves and we detect more and more events, the constraints on deviations from general relativity, well, there are two possibilities. They either get tighter or we're going to see something. Maybe general relativity is not the correct theory. Now, one of the tests that the LIGO experimentalists did was a consistency test. You take the early part of the waveform, the in spiral, and you fit that to these, oh, well, we've now gotten fancy. You'll hear from Alessandra uh, about things like uh, the EOB model, effect of one body and so on. But basically you can think of it as the perturbations of, uh, of this post-Newtonian perturbation expansion 
but just made much more um, um, powerful. And from that, you can read off the two masses, M1 and M2, and the two spins, the magnitude of those that S1 and S2. Actually, they're, they're vectors. So you can put those as initial conditions into a numerical relativity simulation, and you can use numerical relativity to predict what the final mass and spin will be. Now you can go to the ring down part of the signal and analyze that. And from this perturbation theory of the Kerr metric, we learn that that late time waveform, in fact, you can see it by eye. If you just look at the last part of the waveform, you'll see some oscillations, but they're damped very rapidly. Right? It's an, actually an exponential damping of a sinusoidal type of wave. And as I'm going to talk about in more detail in a second, these are called quasi-normal modes, right? So a normal mode of oscillation, right, is something you learn about in freshman physics, right, something oscillating masses on a spring. But if it's got dissipation, right, in our case from gravitational waves carrying off energy, then it's a damped oscillation, and we'll call that a quasi-normal mode, right? And so from the frequency and damping time, you can also infer the mass and the spin, right? And so there's a consistency that has to be held between those two and to within some, you know, within the measurement errors, uh, general relativity past this consistency test. But now we can take this idea of this consistency test a step further. All right, so first of all, what is the no-hair theorem? So the no hair theorem says basically that a stationary black hole is a very simple object. It's described by the Kerr metric, so it only has two parameters, a mass and a spin, right? In principle, you could also have a charge on the black hole, but for an astrophysical black hole, any charge is completely negligible. It gets neutralized by the plasma of... Uh, interstellar space. So on the right is this diagram from way back in the early days of, of black hole studies, um, which is showing all these objects going in to make up the black hole. And you might enjoy looking at that picture of a 1970s television set. Um, but the idea is that the final object if all you encounter is the final black hole, you can't tell whether it was formed by throwing a whole bunch of TV sets down to make a big black hole, or whether it was a collapsing star or baryons or antibaryons or whatever, right? It's still a same Kerr metric. And uh, Wheeler, who was actually uh, completely bald, uh, coined this uh, phrase, the idea is a black hole has no hair. It's a very smooth object. There's no, nothing discernible from the outside other than the mass and the spin, or the J, the angular momentum. And this is not necessarily true in alternative theories. So the question is, can we actually test this idea? And about 20 years ago, there was a proposal that you could do this by using the quasi-normal modes. So if your gravitational wave detector could measure not just that final single quasi-normal decay, but the theory says there should be a, a superposition, many of them with different frequencies and damping times, suppose you can measure the two least damped quasi-normal modes. Then you have two frequencies and two damping times four numbers, but they should depend on only mass and the magnitude of the spin, two numbers. So you have a test of general relativity. And at the time that uh, this proposal was made, the uh, authors of this paper uh, estimated what kind of a detector sensitivity would you need in order to be able to carry out this test. And the signal-to-noise ratio is very low for uh, 
detectors that they looked at like LIGO. And the, the idea was we would have to wait a long time, right? That even LIGO at its advanced sensitivity, which it's not reached yet, at its, sorry, at its design sensitivity would not be uh, good enough. We'd have to wait for things like Cosmic Explorer and so on, or maybe even LISA, a proposed space-based detector, which is gonna fly the, while the nominal date is 2034. We'll see. Okay, so, you know, this was the idea and then people have worked, elaborated this idea in the meanwhile. All right, so I, this is sort of the only slide of equations that I'm gonna show. I just want to review for a second this idea of Kerr perturbations to make more precise what we mean by a quasi-normal model. So um, if I take the Kerr metric, it has symmetry. It's time independent and it has an axis of symmetry, right? The black hole can spin about an axis. So that means when I take the perturbation equations, I should be able to do separation of variables, right? I should be able to separate out the time dependence. So you can see here, I'm working with a quantity. You don't have to know the details. It's a certain component of the vial curvature tensor. I'm gonna call it Psi four. Um, and you can see in the third uh, equation, Psi four is related to two time derivatives of H, the actual strain. So the perturbation theory is done with this, and then you can predict what H is, what the waveform is. All right, so if you look at the expression for Psi four, you'll see the E to the minus omega T. So there's the time dependence with the frequency omega superposition over omega. And then you can see the E to the I M phi, that's from the symmetry in phi. But you'd have no reason to expect uh, to be able to separate variables in, say, R and theta, whatever coordinates you're using for the remaining spatial dependence. There's no particular symmetry. And the big surprise, the miracle, if you like, of the Kerr metric is that, in fact, you can separate those variables in, the, in a suitable coordinate system. Okay, And so I've called the angular functions S and R. And uh, if this was the Schwarzschild metric, then we would expect that spherically symmetric, we would have spherical harmonics, right? Basically YLMs, right? For the, you know, the mathematical types, it's actually spin-weighted spherical harmonics, but we're gonna ignore that. You can just think of them as ordinary spherical harmonics, not important for this talk. The radial part, of this, it's like quantum mechanics, right? The radial part I'm gonna call the wave function satisfies a radial equation, right? And so we're using a coordinate R star, which moves the horizon from a finite radius off to minus infinity. So the domain is minus infinity to plus infinity. In Schwarzschild, which is, so this parameter A is related, is the spin parameter of the Kerr metric. For Schwarzschild, it just looks like barrier penetration problems that you're scattering problems you do in quantum mechanics. In the Kerr metric, the, it's a little more complicated. The omega can be complex and the V can be complex, but we're not gonna worry about those details. So the key thing is that the late time behavior of this wave function, you can, if you look at the late times uh, there, you can see that the radial function just involves a damped an e to the minus i omega, and then there's a t minus r star, right? An outgoing wave that's damped because the omega is complex in general. Right? So it has a, uh, a real part, which is oscillatory, and then a damped exponential. And we can talk about modes. Right, so if we think of these of, of for each L and M that you're doing a superposition of, um, we can talk about HLM as the mode of the waveform, right? And then the N is like a radial quantum number. It comes from that radial equation. There are discrete solutions. Okay. So the N, if I fix L and M, the N are called overtones. 
So this is sort of by analogy with overtones on you know musical instruments and things like that. Uh, it's actually a terrible name, as we'll see in a minute, and it set back the field for 20 years. Uh, I'll explain that in a second. Okay, so omega is complex, has a real part and imaginary part. The imaginary part is basically related to the damping time. So we have a superposition for each L and M. We have a superposition of these damp sinusoids. And we arrange this N, this overtone index, in the order of the damping time. So N equal to zero, the fundamental mode, is the least damped mode. N equal one is the next least damped, N equal two the next, and so on. Okay, so the no hair theorem says these mode, these frequencies and damping times depend only on the final mass and spin. Now, what happened in the field, as I'll explain, was that these overtones tended to be ignored. Right? You find the papers calling them, you know, subdominant and we're going to ignore them and things like that. And partly it's because when a physicist hears the word overtone, they think of musical overtones, right? Where you can play the same note on a violin and a trumpet. It's the same fundamental pitch, but the overtones are different. And that's how you can tell the difference between trumpet playing a particular note and a violin playing the same note. And the, the overtones are subdominant. They're not as powerful in, in amplitude. And as we'll see, that's not true for black holes. Okay, so the first people to, to notice the importance of overtones were in fact two of the other people who are gonna be lecturing uh, this week, Alessandro Bonanno and Franz Pretorius working with Greg Cook. So 2007 was like the stone age as far as numerical relativity was concerned, right? Franz Pretorius had done the first successful um, in spiral calculation, just one or two orbits of black holes only in 2005. And what they found in this paper was that if you took an, they simulated an equal mass black hole in spiral, and they found that the fundamental mode, so the two, two, L equal, the lowest uh, detectable mode of gravitational waves are quadrupole, so it's L equal to two, and then because of this in spiral, it's L equal to M equal to two. And then zero is the fundamental. And two or three overtones, if you superpose that, that gave a good fit to the waveform, not at late, in other words, you, you might think that close to the merger, everything is very nonlinear. You remember Kip's picture with all the squiggles? And that you'd have to wait until the nonlinearities had died away, and then you saw the linear perturbation theory, the linear superposition of the modes. And they, they found that the actually, the even closer to the peak, it looked like you could see the overtones as representing the waveform reasonably accurately. For the experts, you have to be careful, am I talking about the peak of this psi four quantity or the peak of H, but anyway. And when Alessandro developed the uh, effect of one body uh, picture of waveforms, which was used the in spiral part of the waveform, uh, she and her collaborators wanted to cover the merger and ring down as well. So they had this idea of taking the quasi normal modes, which describe the late time behavior with the overtones, but now they had the problem of matching it to the in spiral. So they kind of, you know, they wanted to make a model. So they just sort of made it match. Right? So they distorted the late part of the waveform in a certain sense to make it fit. And they introduced some uh, pseudo quasi and all kinds of, the details are not important. The important thing was that the rest of the world, the community of gravitational wave people missed the significance of this property of quasi-normal modes that they seem to be relevant early in the ring down. The idea took hold in the community 
that quasi-normal modes are good for modeling the waveform because E or B work pretty well, but H was still actually nonlinear at the peak of the amplitude. I mean, after all, it's really expected to correlate with the nonlinear phase of general relativity. Okay, so this is again from one of the very early LIGO papers in 20, early 2016 of testing general relativity. So this is a plot on the y-axis, it's the decay time, on the x-axis is the frequency. And they're attempting to fit, so doing this consistency te test, right? So they take the, so IMR stands for in spiral merger ring down. So this idea of you fit the in spiral, get the M1, M2, S1, S2, use numerical relativity, get the final mass and spin, and predict omega 220, the free, fundamental quasi normal mode. And that's the solid black contour. Right? It's not a dot because there's noise in the detector. The experiment is imperfect. And then they tried to fit a single damped sidusoid, right, the frequency and decay time. And they found it was sensitive to when they tried to start the fit. So if they did the fit at the peak, they got this green contour. You can see it's completely off. Okay, it just doesn't fit at all. If they waited three milliseconds after the peak of the amplitude, they got a much better, at least now, if you look at that sort of triangular shaped contour, at least it encloses the uh, IMR um, measurement. But you can see the center of that contour is biased relative to the true value. If they go to five milliseconds, it's much more centered, but now the signal is getting damped. It's much weaker relative to the noise. So the contour has grown bigger and the accuracy of the measurement is lower. So the takeaway message from this paper was that trying to detect a quasi-normal mode, even a single one, was sensitive to when you started after the peak. And this discrepancy between the green fit, which was way off on the left, compared with the true value, was ascribed to the nonlinearities. And so many papers appeared about, you know, when does ring down start? When is it a good model to use linear perturbation theory? Okay, so at what point do quasi-normal modes, a superposition of them, provide the correct, accurate description of the ring down? And the answer is actually at the peak, right? By including the overtones, in fact, the quasi-normal mode superposition gives a good representation of the waveform. Okay, and so this was uh, what Matt Giesler found uh, as part of his thesis. So let me show you what the argument is. So at the top, I've just reproduced, I fixed L and M to be two, two just for simplicity. And so now we just have a superposition of these damped sinusoids over N, over the overtones. And so what Matt did was he took a numerical relativity waveform. So this is not yet LIGO data. So this means we have a very accurate solution of Einstein's equations. You know, in principle, by spending enough money on your computer time, you can make this as accurate as you like. And then he just did a least squares fit of the, um, you know, he started with a single n equal to zero mode and then fitted it to the numerical relativity waveform using just a standard least squares fit at various start times. So t equal to zero here, on the bottom scale means you're starting the fit at the peak. And then positive means you're starting later into the ring down. And on the y-axis is the mismatch. The details are not relevant. It's basically the overlap integral, how well um, a dot product of the waveform um, 
with the uh, model of superposition of overtones, you know, one minus that, that thing. So a good fit means a very small mismatch down, you know, down 10 to the minus six or 10 to the minus seven. So the blue curve is just fitting a single overtone. So, sorry, just the fundamental. N equal one is you add one overtone and so on. And you can see as you add more and more overtones, the fit gets better and better. The, the mismatch goes down. And also the optimum is reached right around zero, right around the peak. Okay. So, so the takeaway from that is if you believe that this linear superposition is a good fit, it's suggesting that whatever nonlinearities are in the waveform, perhaps they're quite small, at least as the seen in the way, you know, maybe there's strong gravity going on right where the black holes are merging. But by the time the signal gets to LIGO, right, in other words, escapes from the strong gravity, that if nonlinearity is not maybe observable anymore. At least that's the hypothesis that we're going to examine. All right, and so here's another way of looking at it. You might ask, well, how do we know the numerical relativity waveform is sufficiently accurate? So you run your, your simulation at two different resolutions, right? The grid spacing, and then take the difference and give, that gives you an estimate of the error. So you can see on the bottom, so by eye, you can't see any difference between the numerical relativity um, waveform and the superposition of quasi-normal modes. So on the, we do a subtraction that gives you the residual, and you can see that the residual is above the blue. So the blue curve there is the numerical relativity difference in resolution. So that is a bound. The error, numerical error is below that blue curve. Okay, and so the residual is well determined by this fit at about 10 to the minus 4. Okay, here's yet another way to see what's going on. You do your fit with seven overtones. That gives you the amplitudes at t equal to zero for each overtone, if that's what you fit for. And now you plot each overtone with its exponentially damped amplitude. So you can see the blue curve is the fundamental tone, if you like. So it starts at some amplitude. And you see the units here are in M, right? These are gravitational theorist units. So it's basically, if you put in Cs and Gs, it's the light travel time across the black hole. For a 30 solar mass, sorry, for a 60 solar mass total mass here, 10 M is about three milliseconds. So you can see that this fundamental only becomes dominant about three milliseconds after the peak which is exactly when LIGO was able to see it <laughs> clearly, you know, in the right place. That explains why that was true. At earlier times, the overtones, far from being subdominant, you can see they actually have a bigger amplitude at t equal to zero. It's just that their decay times are more rapid. They, re they damp away more rapidly. But if you use them early in the waveform, it gives you a good representation. Okay, so the early part is actually dominated by the old parts. Okay, so when this work got published, um, this is sort of a very interesting uh, thing. I know many of you are students, uh, and you may still have a very idealistic view of science. You know, science is supposed to be this completely objective enterprise right, where you remove all kinds of human bias, you know, as much as you can, and, and everything, you know, is, you know, make a hypothesis and do an experiment and test it and, you know, all this stuff that you learn in, in high school science and so on. Not true, okay? Well, it's partly true. Uh, it's better than many other fields, but science is a human enterprise. And so a lot of times, um, you know, human emotions play a role uh, in, in deciding whether to accept things or not. 
So when this work came out, it actually was quite controversial. And several people um, just couldn't accept this idea that uh, a linear superposition of quasi-normal modes gave a good representation of the, the gravitational wave signal early in time. Right? So I'm going to go through some of the objections that were raised and, and why they're not important. All right, so the first thing was some mathematical types knew that if you take a superposition of damp sinusoids, where you're allowed to fiddle the frequencies and damping times, it's not a complete orthonormal set. You can even, if, even if you try to make it orthogonal, it's not. In fact, it's over complete in some mathematical sense when you add those angular modes. Um, right, that's irrelevant. All right. Um, red herring is one of. I know not many of you are not native English speakers. Red herring is one of those obscure English expressions. I don't even know where it actually originated, but it means it's. It's there, it's an illusion, right? We don't need quasi-normal modes to fit something. In fact, if you have any wave equation, you remember I wrote down that, that thing that looked like a barrier potential for the radial wave equation? Basically, any potential that satisfies some fall-off conditions at infinity, the, the modes, so if you put on boundary conditions, you know, for that correspond to quasi-normal modes, you'll have a you'll have a you have a Green's function solution. There's an asymptotic expansion, and you'll have quasi-normal modes. The details, what exactly the frequencies and damping times are, depend on the on the potential. But the phenomenon of quasi-normal modes for a potential equation is ubiquitous, right? So we have this asymptotic expansion. We know the quasi-normal modes are there. And all we do now is we fit for them. So we're using the existence of the underlying asymptotic expansion to justify the form of the basis functions that we're trying to fit. We don't need, it's not, it's got nothing to do with, we don't need a complete set, okay? So fitting is not the same as making an expansion in a complete orthonormal set. All right, then the next problem that was raised was some Sol, mathematical uh, physicist. Yeah, Sol, can I interrupt you? Yeah, I have a, I have a question. Uh, so when you say fit, uh, I just want to understand the following. Mm -hmm. uh, for a given uh, M and J, one can uh, mm -hmm. check whether the linear uh, sum of, uh, of the quasi-normal modes uh, um, is very close to the full nonlinear solution. So right, full, why, full in a least square sense, yes. Yeah, so, so why do, in, in, I'm not sure to understand the, so this is a statement that does not require a fit. So you, for a given M and J, you know the quasi-normal modes? No, what amplitudes should you use? Right, you, the, you ah. have a complex amplitude in front of these, of these modes, right? I you, see, so you, you know have- the form, right? So, okay, okay, you have, you have the modes, but you don't know the, um, yeah, yeah okay. how much of each mode Thanks. you need to represent the mode. So Thank that's you. what the Thank fit you. does. Thanks. Right. So with seven with 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 a fundamental and seven overtones, that's eight, you have 16 real numbers that you're fitting for. Okay, so some people were worried, you know, there's the old, you know, you give me 16 parameters, I can fit an elephant, right? So the idea was that. Sure, if you give me 16 free parameters, I can model even the nonlinear. The idea was that you're using the linear superposition to model the nonlinear piece of the waveform. Right? That was the, the worry. And, and there is some concern about that, but completeness has got nothing to do with it. Okay, the, the next can, can problem also... that was... Yeah, go, go ahead. Uh, so... Is there a reason not to include higher L modes, higher, um, higher spherical modes? Yeah, so in, in fact, if you want to do this more carefully, you have to, I, I glossed over the distinction between spherical harmonics and then these spheroidal harmonics that come from the perturbation theory. And so LIGO actually measures things, LIGO needs a complete basis because they look at things on the sky. 
they use spherical a spherical mode decomposition. So even from going from spheroidal L's to spherical L's, it turns out there's a, a mix, you know, L equal to two corresponds to a superposition of L equal to two and L equal to three. So to do this a little more carefully, it turns out the three, two fundamental mode is the most important next one. And if you had a high, if you had a high signal to noise signal, or if you had, you know, an accurate numerical relativity waveform, to do this carefully, you do include some higher modes, but I, I'm kind of simplifying things here a little bit. Yeah, but that's a good question. Thank okay, you. so the next, yeah, any more questions? I don't okay, see so any. <laughs> okay. So then uh, the next problem that was raised was a mathematical analysis of these quasi-normal modes suggested that they're unstable. In other words, if you make a small perturbation, for example, to the potential, um, which you would have, right, by the nonlinearities or whatever, um, that uh, you would change the frequencies and damping times by a large amount. And there was a whole analysis, I, I don't want to get into the details, but you can look it up if you, uh, the mathematical technique that's used is called a pseudo spectrum because you don't have, it's not a self adjoint problem because of the dissipation. Uh, so it's not like uh, you can't treat it by, perturb by perturbation. You're perturbing the perturbation theory, but you can't use uh, like, you know, standard, you have to use the perturbation theory appropriate for a, a dissipative system. And um, so, uh, my answer to that, so, well, sorry, let me come, let me say something first. So my answer to that was, uh, mathematics is an experimental science, right, from the point of view of a physicist. Namely, if the, if the mathematics you're using predict something that's in contradiction with the experiment. And what do I mean by experiment here? I mean, the numerical relativity solution of Einstein's equation is a full nonlinear solution. It's an experiment, if you like, right? Except instead of using real black holes, we use computer generated black holes. And that experiment tells us that we can fit the overtones. So if you have a theory mathematical theory that says you shouldn't be able to do that, there's something wrong with the premises of your theory. They don't apply. Now, this is not a popular view among mathematical physicists, you know, because for many years they reigned supreme, right? They, what, if a mathematical type proved the theorem, that was it, okay? That's not true now because People like us who can do numerical solutions to very high accuracy, we're the ultimate authorities, okay? And if your mathematical theorem doesn't apply to my simulation, I believe the onus is on you, not on me, to figure out what's wrong. You can see, again, this is not a particularly popular view, right? So I'm, I'm dramatizing it a little bit because I want to entertain you, right? But Anyway, I think there is some truth in this. Uh, there was a, a recent paper end of last year, Elephant and the Flea. The idea was you make the flea as the small perturbation and so on. And they claimed that, um, you know, this instability was there. We talked to them and, you know, told them, you, you, you know, there's something wrong with what you're doing. They've, in fact, since published a more recent paper, um, uh, which came out just a little over a month ago, that what they found may apply extremely late in the ring down where it's way beyond anything to do with observations. So basically it's not relevant. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. Now, the, another way of, of addressing this question, so th this overfitting is actually has a germ of truth in it, right? Maybe there are nonlinearities and when you do the least squares fit, you again do an overlap integral. 
And so maybe your basis functions are just representing the nonlinearity. They're fitting the nonlinearity with a good enough approximation, right? That you're misleading yourself into saying that the overtones are there. So how would you test that idea? Well, what you can do is you can take the frequencies and damping times, you know what they're supposed to be based on the final mass and spin, and you can perturb them away from their true values. And you can ask, if I use overtones that are not the correct overtones, but are some arbitrary frequencies and damping times in the neighborhood of the true values, how, well a, how good a fit do I do? If it was just a coincidence, then I would expect to find some nearby values that do better. Well, you can see here, you don't have to go into the details. So these are sort of up to 20% perturbations on the frequencies and damping times. And the blue curve is, you know, the actual original curve values. And then everything else above that is worse. Right, so no, now it's true, if you make huge perturbation, you know, if you change the frequencies by a factor of two, you can actually maybe get an occasional thing below the line. But the fact that in the neighborhood, right, it's like a minimum, right? it's the best fit in the neighborhood of the true values. And that tells me at least that any, over, any fit of the nonlinearities is small. You are actually representing the true overtone. That are there. Uh, excuse, skip over that. Yeah. Uh, Question. In the plot, what was the horizontal axis n? So n is the number of overtones, right? So as you go from zero to seven overtones, so n is just the fundamental, and seven is the overtone. This is the, the and the vertical axis. I'm sure I should explain it. Uh, is the error. Uh, in the uh, in the determination of the mass and the spin, right? So our, our criterion is how well do you recover the final mass and spin, right? Because that's what we're fitting to. We, 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 sorry, we fit to the waveform by varying the parameters and then see how well we how well we do. Thank you. Okay. All right, so now let's see what happens with real data. Okay, so we're going to redo the uh, measurement that the LIGO uh, collaboration did. Um, but here, instead of frequency and damping time, I'm going to show it on the vertical axis. Uh, so this is yet another symbol, a dimensionless spin of the final black hole and the mass of the final black hole. So the, the X is the true value, the optimum value determined from the experiment. The small uh, black dotted contour is this IMR thing. So you use the full waveform, including the early part, the in-spiral. But now we're going to do the fit starting at t equal to zero, right? So at the peak. So the blue contour, which completely is off to the right in this case, doesn't include the real value. That's if you just do the, the fundamental. So that's recovering the LIGO result. Add one overtone, n equal to one. And you can see it's quite a big contour because you're not using the in-spiral information. You're only using the from the peak on into the ring down, but it perfectly encloses the true value. Adding a second overtone doesn't do much. All it does is it stretch. You've got another parameter, complex parameter in the fit, so you just stretch out the uncertainty. The contour gets bigger, so that's a signal that you you try to fit too many parameters. But it certainly seems as if one uh, one overtone um, is actually in the data, and you can see it more carefully. If you make what the experimenters like to do, a so-called corner plot. So this is just a fit of, so what's being done here is we're fixing the fundamental. 
And then we're taking the frequency and damping time of the first overtone and we're varying it. So you'll see in the top right bullet point a delta F1 and a delta tau one. And if you look at the delta F1 at the very top plot, the width of that is roughly, I don't know, you know plus or minus 0.2 or something. You're getting roughly a 20% determination. You see where the best fit lies. Um, close to t equal to, to close to delta f equal to zero, so it's zero to with about twenty percent. It's not a great, so this is not precision measurements, but the fact that you can do it at all is what's important, right? If you know about Bayes factors, you can see it's a very modest Bayes factor. It's not an overwhelming detection, but certainly it's consistent with um, with zero. I haven't shown the plot for the amplitude of this overtone. And in the, in the corresponding plot, the amplitude is definitely bounded away from zero, right? So it's, it's present in the data to within some precision. Um, so this is exciting. This means we don't have to wait 20 more years for detectors in space to try to test the Nohair theorem. As the current LIGO detector improves and we get to advance to the full detector sensitivity, and we get another event as strong as 1509.14, just one, there's a very good chance we could carry, carry out this test to maybe 5% or even better. Right? So um, things are looking up for testing general relativity, at least with this no hair theorem. Uh, some of you may have seen a paper that came out in January by uh, a group claiming that they reanalyzed um, the LIGO, the same LIGO data that we did, and there's no evidence for the overtone. Now that paper is wrong, okay? So you can ignore it. I, I won't go into what, they made some, some errors in their analysis. Okay, now another idea that you can do with this. Uh, can I ask? Yeah. So there is a question in the chat. Uh, yes. Is about the previous slide. I suppose it's maybe two two slides back. So you say why the plot has contours? I mean, corresponding to one mass harder two spin value. Because this is real data, right? So real data has uncertainties. There's noise in the detector. So so this is real data analyzed. So here you're doing the least squares fit of the model to the data, but that fit is weighted by the noise. And, and therefore you get, you, you don't only get parameter values, the best fit, but there's an uncertainty in, so if you're fitting for M final and chi final, you get, you know, a centroid from the fit, but there's a spread of values. And so these contours, I think they're 90% contours. So the probability that the true value is inside that contour is roughly 90%. I can't remember which, whether these are 68 or 90 or what they did here. That's, that's whatever LIGO did. Thank you. Another quest. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to ask why, if we include more overtones, the contour becomes larger, or is it simply a typo between? Because the, um, if you add another parameter and the effect of that basis function that you've added to the fit is not detectable in the data, but you've added another parameter. There's big uncertainty in the value of that parameter, right? You can basically make that parameter be in almost anything you like because that particular basis function isn't present in the data, right? It's swamped by the noise. So basically all you're doing is you're fitting to the noise with that extra parameter. Oh, okay, thanks. And therefore the uncertainty in your determination of the fit is bigger. Okay. So this is an example of what happens with, this is real overfitting, right? You, you're not determining the, you, you put too much freedom into the, into the functions. Yeah, thank you. All right, so the area theorem, which, which was proposed by Roger Penrose and proved by Hawking, 
so we call it Hawking's area theorem, um, says that the total, the sum of the total area of horizons of black holes cannot decrease. All right, so here's the formula for the area, and you see it depends again for a curved black hole, isolated black hole, depends just on two numbers, the mass and chi is the dimensionless spin, right? I've got Cs and Gs equal to one. Uh, so chi ranges between zero and one. So the idea is very simple. When the black holes are very far apart, you treat them as two curved black holes. So from the in-spiral part of the waveform, you can get the M1s and the M1, M2, and the chi1, chi2. So you can determine the A1 and A2, you get the total area. Then separately, you analyze the ring down waveform from the peak on by fitting the overtone model. Okay, so that's got nothing to do with how you determine the initial masses. That gives you the final mass and spin. You compute the final area and you check, is it bigger than A1 plus A2? Okay. Um, actually Hawking, um, you know, what, what, when the first uh, LIGO detection was done, one of the first questions he asked Kip Thorne after Kip told him about this detection before it got published was, can you test the area theory? And at that time, Kip said no. Unfortunately, you know, Hawking passed away, but now we can, it turns out you can actually using this idea uh, test the thing. So now we have the overtones. We can do, right, it's actually a little tricky. When you do parameter, when LIGO does parameter estimation, that's actually computed when you do the least squares fit. It's actually done in frequency space because the LIGO noise is known primarily in frequency space. So you do all, you Fourier transform and do everything there. But now if you split the waveform, right here at the peak, let's just look at, for example, the right-hand piece of that. If I was going to handle that in the frequency domain with a Fourier transform, you can see that at late times, the wave, the signal is zero. But at t equal to zero, I have a maximum of the amplitude. So if you think in Fourier space, right, everything is wrapped around, that's a discontinuity. And if I just take the Fourier transform of that data starting a non-zero h and going to a small zero, I'll get Gibbs phenomena, right? Because the Fourier transform of a step function, right? That's where uh, Gibbs phenomenon famously comes from. So there's a standard way to handle this in, in data analysis, which is you taper the wave function. You multiply this in the time domain by something which, which basically um, damps the signal so that it smoothly goes up to a non-zero value. But now you can see that makes the data analysis tricky. If you do the tapering too late, then you don't damp that discontinuity enough, you get Gibbs phenomenon. If you do it too early, you're now mixing, when you do your convolution, you're mixing some of that in-spiral signal, which is being tapered, into your ring down signal. So the trick to doing this correctly is you actually have to figure out how to do the, the analysis in the time domain. And it's a little tricky handling the noise and so on. For the experts, um, if you want to know about it, the, the key word is you, if you need the covariance matrix to estimate the noise, you need to take its inverse, and it's a Toeplitz matrix, and there's a fast way and a stable way of doing it. Okay. And what do you find? All right, so what I've plotted here on the vertical axis is probability density. On the horizontal axis is the change in the area over the, the fractional change in the area. So zero means no change. Everything to the right is positive, area increase. The area theorem is satisfied. And the shaded region is the violation. And you can do the fit either with no overtones or with one overtone. And the area theorem is okay to about 
two sigma, right? So, with, you know, within 95% probability. And again, you know, that's pretty amazing if you think about it. I mean, the area theorem, you've seen the proof, right? It's this very mathematical property relating to bundles of geodesics on these mythical event horizons, blah, blah, blah. And here we can check it, right? And as the detectors improve, we will be able to check it to even higher precision. Okay, and again, the area theorem may not be true if there's scalar hair on a black hole, all kinds of, of weird alternatives to pure general relativity. Okay, so let me summarize. The ring down seem, appears at peak strain. The overtones dominate the early ring down and the nonlinearities in the ring down are surprisingly small, all right? And I'll qualify that, are seemingly surprisingly small, right? So an active area of research now is to try to quantify, you know, by how much do the overtones spuriously fit any real nonlinearities and by how much do they actually, you know, how much nonlinearity. It turns out that's actually surprisingly difficult to do. Um, you know, some people have claimed you can do it by looking at whether the coefficients of those amplitudes are constant. That turns out to be nonsense. You can ask me a question about that um, in, in, if you like later on, but it's actually quite difficult to do. And the overtones enable a first test of the Noheria theorem, Noheria theorem and a first test of the area theorem. Okay, I'll stop there, take any more questions. Thank you. Thank you. A uh, question. Hi, thanks uh, for the talk. Uh, um, I have uh, actually two questions. So uh, one is, uh, is this uh, uh, seeming, seemingly, um, I mean, the fact that uh, after the, the merger, the, the system is, um, is, uh, is linear, does it help to merge uh, the solution with the uh, the, with the previous phase, so is there is some hope to to maybe merge uh, to the inspiring, uh, uh, maybe more more accurately without uh, simulations. Um, so so that that's a good question. So um, these models, like the EOB model that you, I think we'll hear about maybe tomorrow, or whenever. Um, so these are attempts to actually piece together various analytic approximations. So the, the problem is, is the join, right? If you, you don't want to, you know, how, how you go from the Inspiral model into the, into the merger, you know, you'd have a kink or something, right? So the, that's not good for the data analysis. And that's also the part where the amplitude of the signal is biggest. So that's where you need the most accurate determination. So I think the, um, the role of the numerical simulations right now is crucial. It's the only way we really know uh, what should go on. And um, what will be the ultimate, I mean, the problem with numerical simulations is to do parameter estimation on a LIGO detection, you, you might have, you know, I don't know, of order of a million trials. You do this Monte Carlo uh, fit in, you know, some high dimensional parameter space uh, to find the optimum uh, value. And you have many trials. You can't do a million, numerical, each numerical relativity simulation you know, depending on it can take anywhere from two weeks to a month using a supercomputer, right, just for one case. So, so developing good uh, models is, is crucial for the data analysis. Um, and, and, you know, there are various groups working on various different, uh, you know, there's, there's EOB, there's something called phenom, you know, this phenom, this phenom, you know, each is phenom, including higher order modes and blah, blah, you know, 
it's a complicated thing. And, and you know, my group works with surrogate models, which is yet a third way of doing this. So it's, it's an active area of research. Thanks. Uh, so two, uh, two questions from Zoom. Uh, Avira. Uh, so uh, thank you for the amazing talk, sir. So my question is about like, uh, you mentioned that the analysis is done up for equal marks by black holes. And in case of three overtones, the P comes before, before five, four, like five subsets four. So I was wondering like, uh, in case the mass of the black holes is are distinct, like because in case of same mass, we have a symmetry about the center of mass. So if the masses of the black hole differ like uh, much they M1 and M2, they are different by a great factor. Would these uh, like would these analysis or hold? Like the sound may, may be naive, but I was just wondering if the symmetry breaks and maybe the results may be different. Like, um, it's very hard. I don't know of any way to use the symmetry directly in, in you know simplifying the analysis because if you think about it carefully it's actually a tricky symmetry because during an orbit the uh, black holes are radiating and um, the the center of mass is recoiling right there's some momentum going off um, and it's only when you kind of average over an orbit that the center of mass, you know, by symmetry, you know, doesn't move. So it's, a, you know, it's a little tricky uh, to actually microscopically, you know, during an orbit somehow apply the symmetry because it's, it's a symmetry of the whole system not of the trajectories of a black, you know, I don't even know what the trajectory of a black hole actually means in a precise coordinate independent way. Um, so, so the answer to your question is, it's an intriguing idea, but I don't know if anyone has actually managed to use it. Thank you, sir. Uh, may I ask one more question? Sure, go ahead. Yeah. So like uh, we know about the black hole area theorem, like how the area for black hole never decreases and it's directly to, related to the entropy, like the second law of thermodynamics towards that. So mm -hmm. I was wondering like the two theorems of Hawking, uh, the Hawking radiation and the Hawking area theorem. So I was thinking like uh, when, uh, when Hawking radiation occurs, so basically some, uh, some feeble amount of mass is being, take, being taken away from the black hole, right? So this sure. over over an extended period of time, this effect may be may become prominent, and what we have, have that be between for a finite duration of time, the mass of the black hole will will observe that it has decreased, which yes, the, and the area goes, goes down. Yes, the area goes down, but the it cannot happen. So like I found a you know discrepancy well, between these. You, you, you know the answer, right? I told you the answer. If you have a theorem, and it doesn't apply. There's something wrong with your premises, right? I told you. So apply it. So go back and ask what premises go into proving the area theorem. And surprisingly few, but a key one is there's an energy condition, okay, that's applied about the positivity of a particular kind of energy. And what Hawking radiation violates, it's a quantum mechanical, it's a field theory process, it violates that energy condition, right? Which is something you can do, which sort of, you know, even barrier, pen there are many quantum mechanical processes, barrier penetration, Casimir effect, and so on, which violate the, the, that energy condition. So that's the way it out. It's obvious, right? I told Thank you. you. <laughs> Listen to me. Artis. Uh, hi. Uh, no, thanks all for a beautiful talk. I just I didn't quite follow why uh, these overtones were necessary for the test of the area theorem and the no hair theorem. I mean, if you could really do a numerical relativity calculation, uh -huh. why couldn't you directly? 
check. Uh, uh, why do you need because, this? Uh, because to do a numerical relativity calculation, you put down some initial conditions, and now you evolve forward in time. And what theory do you use for that evolution? General relativity. So you've assumed general relativity is correct. So therefore, we're guaranteed that the area theorem will hold. Right, because if general no, relativity is, we're not putting any ah. energy. There's no, uh, there's no matter fields. It's pure general relativity. So if we have vacuum general relativity, then the the area theorem is true, right? And and the other assumption that goes into the area theorem is related to some condition on infinity about asymptotic E flat or something like that, and that we certainly assume with the boundary conditions in the numerical simulation. So we could never find a violation with numerical relativity. Okay, I see. Okay, I have just one comment about the previous section, the uh, previous yes. question that yeah, even though uh, the cl classical area theorem is violated, there is a generalized second law of thermodynamics, yes, which, is, yes, which continues yes, to be true. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Borna. Uh, okay. Hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, I have a question about uh, the overtones. Um, it looks like from your plot that uh, the amplitude, as you said, amplitude of higher overtones is higher at t equals zero. So why did you stop at like n equals seven if you kept more and more? Uh, uh, th that was about the level of precision of the numerical waveform. That we, we, in other words, we could have we would have had to calculate another simulation with higher accuracy. But you know, mm -hmm. so if I showed you a plot with n equal to eight, I, you know, it doesn't, it's the same thing, right? It just, you, those things gets, you know, cloned. I see, okay, okay, okay. But, and, but nothing, uh, nothing, nothing magic about n equal to eight. Yeah, uh, and, and relatedly, do, do you have any explanation? Because uh, we usually, uh, uh, think that the first, the fundamental one is the most important one. Do you have an explanation why like the seventh one looks like to be it's, the it's, most? It's, it's just because when we first learn about overtones, right, in, in undergraduate physics, the first example we see is typically a waves on a string or a violin or you know, some musical instrument. And in that case, the overtones are multiples of the fundamental frequency, right? They're, they're higher harmonics of the fundamental frequency. Those are the overtones. And they're produced with a smaller amp, smaller amplitude, right? So the, you, you pluck the string and you get produce the fundamental and then the overtones are sort of subdominant. In this case, the overtones were defined by a completely different procedure. In fact, the frequencies typically are, they're very close to the fundamental frequency. They're actually slightly lower. They're just, the, the extra solutions, the various solutions that you get from the radial part of the perturbation equation. And the first person who arranged these and named them decided to number them by their decay time. So the fundamental is the least damped and then the next least, in other words, just by the tau, the damping tau. So it's a completely different physical reason to order them in that way. So the idea is that the fundamental is the most important if you wait long enough because it's the least damped. The others will have damped away. The first overtone is the second most important if you wait long enough, and so on. So, if uh, so, what is the uh, least, um, the slowest oscillating one from these frequencies? Oh, the the, the frequencies. The real well, there's an infinite number of modes, and the frequencies they have a very co complicated dependence. You can look. Uh, if you go online, if you search for quasi normal modes, you'll find nice pictures of these as a function of n, and you can see how they 
uh, people plot them in the complex plane, you know, oscillation frequency versus damping time. And you can see they have quite complicated trajectories, not a simple, not a simple rule. But in the neighborhood of the fundamental, they, mm -hmm. they decrease in frequency by, by a few percent. Thanks. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, two questions. So the first one is still yes. a quite uh, conceptual question, I guess. I think I'm uh, still somehow missing the connection between the necessity of the overtones to improve the model and how this actually connects to enabling a test for the no hair theorem, which I think referred to the system being determined by its final mass solely. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think Mass I'm missing an yes. essential Mass connection spin. here. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's what be the first so, question. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So let me let me try to answer that. So, so the key thing is it's a prediction of perturbation theory of the Kerr metric. Right. So the so the Nohe theorem says the final black state, which is an has to be an equilibrium black hole, has to be the Kerr metric. Right. That's the Nohe theorem. Mm -hmm. um, if you then look as you settle down, that's the ring down phase. And again, a prediction of now perturbation theory of the Kerr metric is you should have these quasi normal modes. And you can calculate completely analytically. Well, we use computers, but I mean, in principle, it's, it's analytic um, calculations. It's just root finding in essential, essentially. Uh, you can find all these quasi normal modes. You can predict for any mass and spin you can predict the frequencies and damping times of all the modes. Mm -hmm. So if you can measure the damped sinusoid, so you, you, you fit to the end point, not the in spiral, right? But as you're settling down to the perturbed black hole, if you can find two quasi-normal modes in that ring down part of the waveform, you will have measured um, two frequencies and two damping times. So that's four numbers, but they shouldn't be independent. They should depend only on a mass and a spin. So yes. you've got an okay. overdetermined. Mm -hmm. If you only measured one quasi-normal mode, that would just be a measurement of the mass and spin. It wouldn't be a test. Of yes, two. yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And the second question is, um, you mentioned the this other theory in or paper in general being wrong, why? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so they, in order to do this test, I mentioned you have to include the noise in the detector. So that's contained in the data, and you have to then, if you do the analysis in the time domain, you you can from the noise you get the covariance matrix, and you can do, you can get take the inverse numerically, and. To experts in the subject, it's known that you have to be very careful. It's an, it's an ill-conditioned matrix, and you have to do it carefully. And if you don't do it carefully, uh, you, it's unstable. You get sort of just basically the wrong noise weighting. Um, so that was one of, one of, that was one of the main issues with the, with the problem. Um, there's some other technical issues, but if you're unhappy with that answer, there's been in the meantime, just like again, like a month ago, a paper by a, a completely independent group who actually figured out how to do the analysis in the frequency domain. So a different way of doing the analysis and they find evidence for the overtone. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So again, this is not overwhelming evidence, but it's definitely a way, you know, bounded away from zero. Thank you. Hi, nice for the nice talk. Uh, thank you for the nice talk. And uh, there was a plot I might have uh, misunderstood with uh, the relative error on, I thought it was on the mass and, and spin parameters when adding more and more overtones. This, this one? one? Yes. So what's, in on, what's on the y-axis? So the y-axis is defined at the bottom. So um, oh, right, 
when you do the fix, um, you are, if you look, if you, sorry, if you look at the top equation, right? So what, what's done here is you take the overtone frequency, the true, the true one with the mass thing and multiply it by this one plus Delta. So you just make an arbitrary fractional change um, in the frequency. Okay, so the idea is, you know what the true final mass and spin are, if you like, from a, from a numerical relativity simulation with the initial masses and spins. We take the frequencies and we're gonna do the fit with some, where we don't fit with the true values, where we just fiddle the values a bit. Mm -hmm. So if we were just fitting the nonlinearities early, and we're doing, we're doing this starting at t equal to zero, right, with a peak of the waveform. So if we, if, if we were just, if all we were doing in the early part was actually fitting the nonlinearities, then we would expect there's nothing special about the true values at that point. And so there's a, there's a probability that by adjusting them slightly, we would get a better determination of the final mass and spin. Okay, and we don't. So that's the argument for saying that those using the actual values, treating them as true quasi-normal modes uh, is not an arbitrary fit to nonlinearities. The, those quasi-normal mode amplitudes are actually present even at t equal to zero. Okay, thank you. Hi, thank you for the talk. Very, very interesting. Um, I was wondering, clearly the situation is a bit different, but can we use these overtone source in the case of neutron star mergers? And if yes, what can we say in that case? So neutron star mergers are much more difficult to do. So first of all, they're more difficult numerically because in addition to solving Einstein's equations, you have to solve all the complications of nuclear equations of state and magnetic fields, neutrinos and so on. The main reason it's difficult to imagine doing a test with that is that when the two neutron stars merge, not all of the initial mass ends up in a, first of all, they have to make a final black hole, but not all of the mass goes into the final black hole. Some of the mass is ejected. And we can't measure that very easy, very accurately directly. So it's done, it's done by a combination. If we're um, like, you know, the famous uh, neutron star merger that was seen with, or, you know, multi-messenger with optical and gamma rays and so on, um, from the electromagnetic radiation and fitting that to numerical models, one could estimate how much mass was actually lost. And it was about 5% of the mass. But the error bar on that 5% is large, right? So the original numerical models predicted at most 2%. And it turned out to be actually a more like 5%. So the state of the art in numerical modeling of, numeric, of neutron stars is just not as good because of the matter part of the complicated. The, the, the gravitational waveform can still be reasonably accurately done, but, but not as well as pure geo. Also, we don't start with two black holes. So what area would we be, would we be looking at, right, in terms of increase? Uh, we just have one black hole, namely the final one. Are there more questions? Uh, if not, I have a question. Uh, is, um, is there a good model uh, in which this cause and normal modes are modified? Good model, I mean, one good example. Well, 
Um, yeah, so, so people are looking at alternative theories of gravity. Uh, it's actually very hard to make an alternative theory of gravity that is, uh, so now I'm talking about, you know, a classical theory, I'm not even interested in, 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 in this point of view of uh, you know, quantum gravity. So people have taken, you know, effective field theories and, you know, things like uh, dynamical churn, Simon's theory and, and so on, which um, may be low energy limits expired by string theory or something like that. And you know, and asked, could we could we see deviations from general relativity? So it turns out it's actually very difficult to actually even predict uh, what you might see in a LIGO event from these things, because for a lot of them, in the classical low energy limit, the equations on are mathematically opposed. Um, often, you know, if you have a higher curvature theory, um, you'll end up, for example, instead of like Einstein's equations with two time derivatives of the metric, you might have four time derivatives. And now you have to ask the question, is this a, a well-posed theory? Does it, you know, if I give you initial conditions, can you actually predict the future? And for a lot of these theories, they just, you know, they're, they're unstable when you formulate them that way. Um, so, but there have been attempts to try to do them in, the, in an effective field theory sense. Uh, so Masha Okunkova, who was my graduate student at Caltech uh, a few years ago, uh, she took dynamical churn Simon's theory in the effective uh, field theory limit and actually looked at what the in spiral waveform uh, would look like. And other people now are using her work trying to look at in particular the quasi-normal modes. She focused on the in-spiral part of the of the merger. So, so this is ongoing work that people are looking at for trying to make detailed predictions. Thank you. So there was a promise to have a group photo now, but I don't exactly know how it's going to happen. Um, Okay, so if if no one else knows, then I guess we can have a break, and then return uh, for the for the student talk. Okay, let's just start a bit later, maybe at four. Okay, thank you. Thanks.